I don't know if Emacs will ever become mainstream, but we can always hope. Let's see. So yes, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the Erlang Development Tool Suite, <coughs> which uh, is basically a set of tools to make your Emacs life slightly easier with Erlang. Um, Who am I? My name is Thomas. Uh, I work at Klarna. Uh, I was born and raised here in Stockholm. Um, studied in a Master of Science uh, here at the Royal Institute of Technology, KTH. And I joined Klarna in August of 2010. I've been working with Erlang since. I had never ever seen it before. Um, so, uh, like most people that come from university, I guess, these days, with all <clears throat> you're used to full screen, well, IDEs that clutter your uh, screen with all kinds of stuff. So uh, getting into the Erlang world initially uh, was quite a, a horrific experience for me, really. <laughs> I mean, it has a lot of nice things about it, uh, but unfortunately, the tooling support uh, is not one of them. Uh, so if you look at the tools that we have today, we have Erlang mode. So these are just, uh, this, uh, this entire talk is going to be uh, Emacs-centric. Uh, and if you're not using Emacs, you should start. <laughs> Uh, so we have Erlang node, which is quite nice, um, although limited. Uh, Distel, uh, also pretty nice, and it has a lot of nice features, pretty powerful, uh, but it's unfortunately pretty dis difficult to set up, especially for uh, a newbie like I was. Um, <coughs> it also lacks uh, some very important, some features that are very important if you uh, work with Erlang pr uh, professionally, such as uh, working with several uh, projects at the same time, and uh, things like that, or several branches at the same time. Uh, Flymake, uh, which, granted, I've, I haven't tried in a very long time, but the last time I tried to use it, it regularly crashed my entire Emacs session. <laughs> so that's also, uh, I think that also falls under the, into the difficult to set up category. Uh, Wrangler, very nice, uh, but um, more of a science project, really, than uh, uh, a main uh, tool, I would say. Uh, I mean, well, it's a great tool, actually, but uh, <laughs> it, it's a little bit limited, unfortunately. So uh, basically, this whole project came out of my own frustration because I felt that I wasn't being productive enough. I, I was missing so many things. Like, it started with just being able to run, uh, have distal connect with several nodes at the same time, and then I wanted auto-completion, and um, other things. So, I mean, to me, there's... I mean, EDTS is... It's, I like it a lot, but it's not really anything to be excited about. It's more about like achieving some kind of hygiene hy hygiene level for uh, your development environment where you have, I mean, these are tools that developers in pretty much any other uh, programming language just take for granted. Uh, so what is it? <coughs> it's basically uh, a bunch of different ELIS packages uh, that I've put together, uh, written some customized plugins for them. Uh, and a bunch of glue code in Elisp and Erlang with bo both to tie everything together and to add some additional functionality. Uh, and the way that it works is basically that once you have configured your project, I'll show you how to do that a little bit later. It's, uh, in the standard case, it's very, very simple. Sometimes you, if you're working with a simple ac single application, you won't uh, usually even have to make, do any, um, any setup at all. Um, but you, after you've configured your project and you open your first module inside the project, EDTS will fire up uh, a primary EDTS node uh, that Emacs communicates with over a REST interface, and that will then communicate um, with a, a project node that you fire up one per project where you have uh, an open module. So this is an example of... Uh, this is like an advanced configuration. <laughs> Basically, so this is uh, in case you can't live with the defaults. Uh, this is you just create a .edts file inside your project uh, where you specify some things. If you want, to, in this case, you have an additional um, directory where you have some source code. Uh, you want to have a specific name for your project. You want to name the the, the node that your project is running on, uh, and you don't want to use. You have a specif specific location where your OTP is installed. So this, that's very useful for us at Clonox. We're working with multiple OTP releases at the same time for different projects. So basically what happens when you open a module inside this project is that you know, <coughs> Emacs or EDTS, the Emacs side of EDTS will fire up 
to our Lang nodes and communicate with the main, the primary EDTS node over REST, and then use normal Erlang distribution to communicate with your project node. Uh, you can also start your project outside if you prefer, so you don't actually have to have your, uh, your node running inside of Emacs. You can start your actual system outside in the terminal, and EDTS will just recognize that and communicate with that node instead using Erlang, and uh, distributed Erlang. So what do you get? Uh, you get some lightweight project management, uh, mostly useful for the developer, or if you want to, if you want to extend, uh, if you like uh, doing some scripting in Elisp, there's, uh, there's some convenience a lot of convenience functions for working with uh, files in the same project. You get very, uh, some very convenient highlighting, some, again, like basic functionality that just improves your life so much. Uh, you can also edit all occurrences of a variable or, an, or uh, a symbol uh, at the same time very easily. Uh, Auto-completion, a nice shell wrapper with syntax highlighting and again, auto-completion. Uh, and in the buffer, every time you save, you will compile, show errors in the buffer, run a unit test, may do xref checks, you can do uh, the dialyzer analysis very easily. I've disabled that by default when you save because on older uh, OTP releases it takes quite a long time, unfortunately. Um, and you get uh, very convenient access to documentation, which I will also show you how to set up in a minute. So, this is more of a demo really than a talk actually. I'm, not gonna, I'm just going to show you um, how easy it is to set up and the different things that you, uh, that you get when you install it. So that's what I'm going to do now. So I have a little bogus project here. I hope everyone, yeah, that should be good, big enough for everyone to read. Um, it's basically a bogus project here with all the code and the lib di directory, um, <coughs> two different applications, no app files, but that's, I don't know. EDTS doesn't work with, with the app files currently anyway. Um, so I'll just open one of these. Um, So here you have it. Uh, I don't, currently EDTS is not enabled at all, so I just have syntax highlighting basically. And I will go to my uh, Emacs configuration. Um, so you have to excuse me, by the way, because I'm the worst typist in the world as soon as anyone is looking on my at my screen. Uh, so I'll probably make a lot of mistakes. Go yeah. <laughs> uh, let's see. There we have it. So you basically, you, you pretty much, you only have to add two lines um, to your Emacs configuration. One to add EDTS to the load path, and one to require it and actually load it. There we go, that's all you need. So if I now go to one, and uh, I revert this buffer, um, you can see that it fires up the node, so um, you see here that I have one e primary EDTS node and uh, one node uh, that's for the project. So now I've, I think I forgot to delete a file here, unfortunately. <laughs> so now it, um, yeah, I have a so I have my project configuration file here, but you can see that uh, oops, it's actually empty. Uh, and still, uh, e and EDTS recognizes that this is a project, and it actually um, um, sets up the co code path and everything. Whoops. Yeah. Like I said, I'm a horrible typer. So many people as well. Um, Yeah, the demo devil is killing me, I think. Let's do this again. <laughs> Let's do it like this. All right. 
So, well, you can see that we get at least, uh, you get right away some variable highlighting. You see all the occurrences of this variable, for instance. Um, you can edit uh, either all the occurrences of it in the same, in, in the entire file, uh, or all just in the same Erlang function. So you get that pretty easily. Uh, you right away also get uh, auto-completion, um, for example. And let's see. And also, you can see compilation errors right away. Uh, so <coughs> uh, these two are actually not compilation errors, but uh, extra errors, because it can't find uh, the module. There's something wrong with the path. I don't know why this happens every time when you're supposed to show something. That's there. Ah, no. Okay, yeah, that was intentional, actually. Right. So, <laughs> because you're calling, it, this one is calling a function that doesn't actually exist. So if you go to 1, 2.erl, uh, this one is actually rd1, where it should, whereas it should be rd0, or it should not be, but the other function is calling an rd01. Uh, so if we change this, uh, we'll get an extra error here, error here, but you can see that the extra error here was fixed. Uh, um, <coughs> Do you need them to compile the one to the module for that to occur? Um, no, well, it does it automatically when you save. It will compile it and load it on your project node. Mm -hmm. so Meeting which make flags? Uh, well, no make flag. Well, it will. So, um, in order for this work entirely correctly from the start, your project should be compiled. Preferably when you open the when you open the modules, uh, and then uh, you can specify some you can specify include locations if you need some special include locations uh, in the project configurations. But other in the project in the project configuration, uh, but otherwise uh, EDTS will just take the, the the compiler directives that you've given it previously. It will read that from the beam file and apply those when it does the compilation again. On the previous yes, exactly. Do you yeah. Did it answer the answer your question? Yeah. Oh, cool. Um, and we can do. Um, a dialyzer analysis, which will take some time to get back with the result, but it should happen eventually. There we go. So you can see here, uh, function one has no local return, for example. Uh, and you also you should also get right away you get code jumping same as distil uh, but slightly more powerful you can jump to macros you can jump to uh, you can jump to records and you can jump to include files yeah uh, so documentation like it. No, unfortunately not. I mean, um, you can't do that. Can no, no. Then you would have to find out all the all the beam files that include this file. Yes. Yes. I I have a plan to to um. Well, basically, I mean, EDTS reload. When, whenever you work with files, uh, EDTS does a lot of reloading. Um, so in in general, EDTS tries to tries to figure out what you want to do, and does I mean this will not necessarily correspond to what your uh, what your build process does. So sh you should always like make sure that you have a proper build um, using your normal build procedures uh, because yeah, it's just just a lot of work to figure out what like how your build procedure will actually work. Yes. Uh, once you no well, there's no. Um, I don't pull the f the files and check if they're updated. 
um, I, I pull which which files exist, and once you, if you if you're working with it, uh, then it, it will pick it up. So it, once you if you um, if you open the file, it will it will reload it will reload it on the server. So you you might have to re if you compile it from the outside, uh, you might have to revert the buffer inside Emacs to uh, to for ETS to pick up the changes, or you can. Exactly. Yeah, but you have to for you 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 have to force edt well you have to force the the project node to actually reload the beam file after it has been compiled. Um and that's not so far done uh, automatically. It's something that I would like to do. Um but I'm kind of struggling with the uh, like the idea of whether to be um like Yeah. I would just kill the project buffer, uh, project node, and re revert. If, so if you just kill the project node, then and re uh, restart it, uh, it will everything should work. So would it be sufficient to reload those modules, or do you have to do some work? No, no, it's it's uh, it's enough to just reload them. Uh, um, ex the extra state won't be updated uh, until you actually save anything. But once that happens, it should be, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that sounds sounds like a neat idea. Does it pull the file system? I think so, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. That works. Actually, I, I I don't know how that how well that scales though. If you have a large project, but uh, I've been looking into the I, to I notify and and other other things, but uh, I'm sort of struggling. I don't know if whether to try to maintain like cross cross platform portability uh, or if I should just do this for for Linux, uh, which is the only thing that really matters to me. <laughs> And uh, oops, ah. Oh. Uh, so you see, there's, there's an XREF error here where uh, you, it, you can't find two because basically two is in another. Uh, right now, it because it couldn't find the project configuration. It considers one to be the project. And it says like, hey, this looks like an um, this looks like an application. I will create a temporary uh, project for this application uh, and launch a project node for that. So that's why you can see um, that this is this buffer is is called one, and the, the the node is called one because that's the name of the application. So if we just kill these, and create a, a project configuration file uh, at the top of the project, and Revert this buffer. You should see that we instead get something here called uh, it's called demo because that's, that's what the project is called. Basically, it's uh, where I decided that the root of the project should be. And now, if everything works the way that it should, <laughs> um, I should be able to save this buffer, and it should find the two fun. And it get an internal server error. I probably have to kill this buffer as well. Okay. So this is of a development branch that will hopefully get merged into the master very soon, but uh, uh, still not perfect. Um, yeah. So if I now save this buffer. I still can't find that. It's annoying. So this is at least how it should work. I've done this so many times. I mean, it's it's right there in the code path. But it can't find it. So there's uh, there's a bug somewhere. <laughs> No, it's right there. Mm. 
Now it's gone. Uh, <laughs> I had to save the. Um, so, w okay, yeah. There's a there was a, there's a bug apparently in how I update the extra uh, state. I will have to fix. Uh, but now it works. So now I can just jump into this function without any uh, any trouble. So this this should only really be a, a problem when you go from one project type, well, from a temporary project into uh, using a project configuration. So. Once you've done that correctly, it, it should all be fine. Um, and that's, uh, I think that's, well, no, we have this as well. So if you go to this, uh, we can easily see uh, who calls this function and jump to them. Uh, well, that was itself, because that's. Hmm. So, yep, and that's pretty much it. Not perfect, not a perfect demonstration, but uh, um, these things um, is very these, these things are very much in development. They've been they've been for a while, um, and if you if you're missing anything or if you have any problems, uh, just uh, please open an issue on GitHub or anything. Oh, you have to show, have to show you how to get it as well. So Uh, it, it does completion on macros, not on the arguments of the macros, but yes. So, so you exactly it's right there, uh, and also it completes records as well. So uh, you get that as well. It, the the, the auto completion is something that um, can always get better. You can always make it better, and uh, some people will be annoyed. Some people will uh, think it's awesome. So um, I'm kind of, kind of working on that all the, the entire time, and tweaking it a little bit. Yes, it's currently not working that well. But you're supposed to. Oh yeah, I, I forgot to show you the documentation actually. So. If you want to install the Erlang documentation, you just call the EDTS man setup. Uh, it will add a customized variable to your Emacs configuration. Um, oh yeah, the network is so slow. <laughs> oh, that's sad. Well. Uh, once you have the documentation installed, that's a completely automated procedure. It just does it automatically, and when you're done, you will get uh, you'll get pop-ups here. Ah, oh, you get it there as well. I already have it installed. Apparently. So you you'll see um, for the <coughs> from the documentation what this actually is. Basically, so this is probably directly from the source code, I think. Uh, and it should it should fetch the doc strings from your from your uh, from your own source code or the documentation from the OTP documentation if you have that installed. So for your own for your own code you'll get the doc string and the spec, and for the, for the OTP stuff you'll get the the documentation. Question. Yes. Okay, uh, the <laughs> question is, if you spell something bad and you save it, is it compiled? And where do you see the compile messages, the warnings and stuff? So, if you do, well, something like this. Uh, you will get an error, mes an error message there, and you just, if you just, uh, Put the cursor over it. You will see the error message uh, okay. in the message area, and you can jump between issues uh, with keyboard shortcuts. Okay, thanks. 
So let's see. That's pretty much it. Uh, for the future, I intend to fix all the bugs. <laughs> Uh, there's also ongoing work, uh, although it's been a little bit dormant for a while, but I've, I'm trying to pick it up again uh, to create, build an interface to the debugger, similar to the one that's present in Disto, uh, but with less hassle around it. Uh, so I want in buffer running of common test, uni uh, common test tests. Uh, so when you to like improve working with those a little bit, uh, and I want to find some. Co sort of integrating or being compatible with the refactoring tool uh, because that's a r something that's really important, I think. Uh, so, so far I've been looking at Wrangler a little bit, uh, but also Refactor Earl uh, seems to be a very good alternative there. So I'll have, have to look into that a little bit more in the future. Yep. <laughs> uh, you... Is it on? Is it on? Okay, we can hear it. Um, you're working with Matt Confist, right? Uh, yes, he's a yes, colleague yes, of mine. Yeah, so when you talk about interface to the debugger, you may want to look into Redbug. Mm, yeah, J I'm... Just to make him happy. It'll, it'll, it'll probably further your career quite a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, I plan on actually... Uh, oh, that's also something I should probably put in here. Uh, just including EPER with EDTS. So you ju just... Compi compile and, and load uh, EPER on your project node, so you just always have it available. It's something, something that I do. I always, I mean, I, I have it in my .erlang to add EPER to the code path, so I always have it. But uh, I don't think everyone actually does that. So if you want to check it out, you can find it on GitHub. Uh, that's my email. If you um, have any questions. Uh, otherwise, uh, I mean, I, I try to respond as quickly as possible on, on the GitHub as well. Um, and any feedback and or pull requests are very welcome. Thank you very much. <laughs>